Hello, friends. I'm Pastor Pitts Evans. Welcome to the Whole Word Podcast. Let's get right to the Word of God. We're about to begin the next chapter, and it starts out with the words, Then Hannah prayed. I want to say that um, Hannah's prayer is much more than a prayer. Uh, It includes a lot of prophetic elements, and uh, we'll look at those as we finish the chapter and I review it. But just carefully note uh, the details spoken in Hannah's prayer and think about some of the significance of the words that she prayed. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by Him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven sons. But she who has many sons now pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants. But the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah. But the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, Let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, No, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman, to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. 
did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar and to burn incense and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Now, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of everything made by my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house, so that no one in it will reach an old age, and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength, and all of your descendants will die in the prime of life. And whatever happens to your two sons, Hopni and Phineas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread, and plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have some food to eat. So it's a rough ending on this chapter, but let's back up to Hannah's prayer slash prophecy, this amazing uh, litany. First, she starts out and says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Now, remember, this is given um, after the fulfillment of her prayer for a son, and Samuel had been turned over to the priesthood, so she's celebrating the victory. She goes on to say, there's no one holy like the Lord. There's no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. And so an early reference to the rock, and Jesus later is proclaimed to be the rock. And so he, she continues uh, that people shouldn't be talking with arrogance because the Lord knows everyone's words and deeds, they're, they're weighed and considered. Uh, she says that she who was barren has borne seven children, but she who had many sons pines away. Now, Hannah was not talking about herself because we learn later in this chapter that she had three sons and two daughters. So counting uh, the sons and daughters were only five. This seven, this is a poetic expression about um, uh, those who had previously been fruitful and others who had been barren, that the Lord would take care of the barren like he had done for her. So this um, prophetic utterance, just talking about the faithfulness of God to make her fruitful, and he'll do the same for others. She goes on to say in verse 8, He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. Now, this, of course, is talking beyond uh, the days of flesh. This is talking about what comes next, that um, as it was said in the New Testament, the first, many who are first will be last, many who are last will be first. And she precedes that utterance prophetically. And then she finishes in verse 10. She says, the Lord will give strength to his king. Now, remember, at this point, there was no king. And he will exalt the horn of his anointed, his Mashiach. Now, the anointed, I believe, again, is a reference to the future Messiah. The king is a reference to the future king. And so Hannah had a bit of a prophetic anointing. Um, as we will soon find out, her son Samuel has a dramatic and powerful prophetic anointing. But his mother may have walked in a measure of this as well, as we could judge by this prayer. And so Samuel ministers before the Lord under Eli the priest. We learn in verse 12 that Eli's sons were scoundrels. Uh, they treated the Lord's offering with contempt. And so what they did was they took all the best offerings the people brought for themselves. And, of course, this made the people reticent to come and worship the Lord and give their offerings. So their, their big offense, even though they slept with the women at the temple, which was a horrible thing, too, their biggest offense 
was that they were polluting the sacrificial system by perverting it and taking the best of the offerings intended for Yahweh for themselves. And so the people were reticent to approach the Lord. The Lord wanted all men to come to him. And these men, Phineas and Hopni, the sons of Eli, the scoundrels, were treating the offering uh, like their own property. And so they were separating the Israel of God from the God of Israel, if you will. All the while, Samuel is growing up. He's ministering before the Lord. He's wearing a little linen ephod, just like a priest. And his mother, um, every year, is bringing him a new, new little robe. And then a prophecy is given to Eli about his wicked sons. In verse 34, And what happens to your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, will be a sign to you. They will both die on the same day. And so this uh, prophetic sign, these two wicked sons would die, not just in the course of events, but on the same day, was told to Eli. And the Lord went on to say that he would raise up a faithful priest for himself uh, to do what was in his heart and mind. And of course, that's young Samuel growing up in the wings. And uh, the Lord went on to say that Eli's entire family line would be uh, struck with premature death and poverty as a result of, of the corruption that he had tolerated among his sons. Now, just a word, a quick word or, or two. These sons were grown men. And so in a way, Eli uh, could have said, well, they're, you know, they're of age, they can do what they want. The problem was that Eli was functioning as the judge of Israel and the high priest of the tabernacle at Shiloh. So these men, even though they were his sons, were his subordinates. Uh, He had the authority to stop them from what they were doing vocationally because he was the high priest and he was the judge of Israel. And so Eli's parental responsibilities were one thing, but his priestly duties and his um, a governmental responsibility before Yahweh were quite another thing. And so as a father, he might have been able to say, I can't control my grown sons. That's true. But as the high priest and the judge of Israel, you can fire your grown sons who are perverting the worship of Yahweh. That was the problem. So sometimes people think when they read this story, that if a godly person has ungodly adult children, that they're like an Eli. No, this is a unique situation in that Eli tolerated uh, their bad behavior towards the sacrificial system and toward the women who were ministering at the temple, which Eli had responsibility for. And so the role of father was subjected to the higher role of high priest and judge of the nation in this instance. And so in that respect, um, Eli had a responsibility to set these boys down from their position. They would have still been his sons, but they wouldn't have been treating the Lord with contempt, and they wouldn't have been treating the people of of God with contempt, with Eli's blessing, essentially. So, Lord, um, this is a tough, tough word that's given to Eli, that his sons would die on the same day and that his family line would be um, struck with poverty and premature death. But, Lord... um, Eli was warned. This prophecy was a point in time when Eli could have repented, but apparently he did not. And uh, we assume that you had spoken to Eli before. So, Lord, um, not to make light of Eli's responsibility, remind us of our responsibilities as parents, as men and women of God, as children. Lord, that um, you're watching. And, Lord, um, you're very gracious. You're full of love. You're kind. But, Lord, you do observe our behavior. Give us the grace to walk in godly behavior. Give us the grace to correct those things that need correcting on this side of the grave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Whole Word. It was brought to you by Whole Word Fellowship and the Northern Virginia House of Prayer. If you were encouraged, please share our podcast with your friends. We'd also appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app and take a few moments to write a review. If you'd like more information on our church and our ministry, you can go to wholeword.net or wholewordpodcast.com for more information. Thank you again, and may the Lord Jesus bless you today and always.